Uh, welcome everybody to the Ortelius Architecture meeting on April 25th. Let me share my screen. And we're going to kind of pick up where we left off uh, last week. So last week we were working on um, some of the GitHub actions. Um, and remember we went through and broke out um, based on the uh, AMD and ARM, um, we actually broke out the, so they built in two different uh, steps. Um, what ended up happening uh, was after that built, when we went and looked at the Docker uh, registry, um, the last one that got built was the one that, oh, um, was placed into the registry. So, um, meaning that we can't have the same tag um, for both AMD and ARM. Um, so they basically uh, needed to be done all in, in one go. Um, and so that was causing a problem. Um, so just to refresh everybody's, uh, the, the problem that we're running into is if we did a build of the MITRE um, uh, microservice, uh, the MITRE microservice, because it goes through and builds, um, does some, basically builds uh, the model uh, of some of the MITRE uh, techniques and stuff. So when it goes through and does that, it, um, it takes a really long time. So uh, it takes like over an hour for that Python script to run and to generate uh, the model that we could save. So uh, like Elizabeth, like you're saying uh, on the Discord channel about Pickle um, was one of the ways you can persist the model. Um, Pickle, uh, that Python library isn't secure um, there's a bunch of vulnerabilities in it. So we had to use a updated um, mod, uh, updated uh, way to persist that. And it's called job lib. Um, so what will happen is instead of using pickle to persist it, we use job lib. Um, let me bring up that so you can see what I'm talking about. Miter. There it is. So it's this project here is our problem child. So this is the um, uh, the job live file and when we go through and um, we'll, we'll load that, that job lab file. Um, so one of the things it does is if we pass in a, uh, a parameter of load data, um, we'll actually go out and create the job lab file. If we, if we don't pass in the job lab, uh, the load data parameter, we'll go to check to see if there's a job lab file already existing. And if it is, we'll go ahead and reuse it. So what that does is it um, allows us to um, create all this uh, ML data um, outside of the container startup. So uh, here is where we actually start the, the, uh, the microservice running at the bottom here. So this is starting up the microservice. Um, so we can then start throwing uh, queries at the RESTful API endpoint. Um, so instead of having the microservice start up and load, you know, go and uh, download and create this job lib file, and which would mean that the microservice would take an hour to start up, um, and it will just give us headaches and Kubernetes. Um, we broke it out into pre-load, pre-creating that file. 
so that when the microservice inside of the Kubernetes cluster will recognize that it already exists and that we can start using it right away. Now, like I said, last time we broke out, uh, did some breakouts and stuff like that to um, make things, try to get that happening so we can have uh, the AMDM arm uh, all in a Docker image. What ended up happening was um, the, uh, that just didn't work, cause like I said, because of the tags. Um, so what I ended up doing after our meeting was I went through and added a, a step because the GitHub Actions have Python installed. Um, we could tell it to go ahead and uh, basically install our requirements um, and then go ahead and run uh, that uh, preload uh, data. Now you'll see that these, this whole section here, 78 to 94, um, that only happens if they are on a specific, uh, if you get the load data passed in. So if it's a regular microservice, um, we're gonna skip all this, these steps um, as part of that process. Now, one of the other things I found out um, was this action, which I never knew, this, this Docker build push action. Um, actually, is, if you don't pass in the context parameter, actually does a, a, a git checkout. So one of the weird things was we, we go through and do all this work, uh, create that, the, the MITRE job lib data, and then when we come to the, the Docker build, it wouldn't be there. And it was because a job, um, uh, that action uh, kept on overriding and checking out the code because that, that, that job lib file doesn't exist in, in uh, GitHub because uh, it's just a huge, it's like a 700 meg um, binary file. So um, what, I had, what I finally figured out was you set this context uh, parameter and it will use the context that the job is actually running in instead of uh, doing another checkout of the repo. So all the said and good, um, what we end up with is when we do our run, we go out and create our, our data, and then we're able to get both the ARM and, and AMD out there. So if we actually look at a run of that, So there's our repo. And if you look at our actions, so if we go to main, so we'll look at, there we go. So these are all the, the renovate branches for the update dependencies. So here's one of the last ones that ran on main. It, it was a merge, a automatic merge. And if we go to the release step, you see that it's running an hour and a half long. And if we go through the steps, um, we log into Quay, we set up Python. Um, and that is happening because we have that load data uh, equals true. So we go set up Python. Um, here we install all of our, our uh, dependencies um, to run our, our Perl program. And you'll see that even installing the dependencies, they get pretty big. It's like an 800 meg um, install that ends up happening. Um, but because we're doing it in a job, uh, in the job step, it's not a big deal. Um, we just need it to be temporary so we can get that job lib file, that MITRE job lib. Let me get back up here. So if we look at the actual execute of the script, so we'll see when we um, execute that Python script with the load data, um, what ends up happening is it downloads a bunch of uh, ML, uh, resources. 
So basically we go through out to hugging face, which is where a lot of these models are stored. Um, and we're bringing in the, the stanza, um, one of the stanza models for natural language processing. Um, so that's all being downloaded. And then we go through and we add a bunch of different uh, processors and parsers. Um, so like tokenize, position, lemma, uh, deep parse. And what this, what this does is it takes these JSON files and the JSON files are from MITRE and the, they have a description of your uh, techniques. So for example, like SQL injection is a, is a, a technique and there's a description um, for each technique. And what we're doing is we're running the, that description through our ML uh, model and we're creating a vector. So when it says processing, we're processing that specific technique uh, and we're get creating a vector. And that's the vector that um, we're persisting into the uh, MITRE job lib uh, file. So it, like I said, it runs quite a way, uh, you know, here for the enterprise attack techniques are 625. Uh, you'll see that we do the mobile phone stuff later on and ICS. So eventually we get all that, um, I just saw it. Here's the mobile attack, 114 from them, uh, 61 for, or 81 for ICS. And then at the end, we'll persist that uh, file. So now when we get to the, our Docker build uh, and we got our context all set up, we actually are able to uh, copy over our uh, MITRE job lib file into our Docker image. So basically we do all this pre-processing and then we copy that file into both the AMD and ARM64 uh, world. Now, one of the things that we have that I kind of posted out on Discord is um, instead of running this process, this step every single time, is there a way that we can cache this, uh, have the GitHub Actions actually cache this joblib file? So instead of us going out and generating it every single time, um, we can go ahead and grab the cached version um, that's being stored on GitHub for us and use that. So in order to do that, we're going to do the GitHub. This isn't a Docker build, eh? Uh, it's pre-Docker build. Okay. So the Docker builds will be cached. Um, some of them will be, parts of it will be cached, but because we have this, if we go back to oh, the see. snap, See, yep. I understand the intuition for cache, but what does a cache file look like? Uh, the cache file is internal to um, the GitHub. So GitHub will uh, cache the files somewhere in its world out there. And um, that we just say, I want this, the, this file copied from the cache into my build. I see. Does GitHub offer something like GitHub Action for caches? Yep, that's what we're looking at right here. Oh, beautiful. You need some persistent type of storage, right? Yeah, um, it has uh, this action. Um, we'll actually go out and talk to get the, to the GitHub APIs to um, store the file um, between jo uh, job runs. So Does it's it remove like, it after a while. Is it like a expiry time? Yeah, I think it has a ninety day cache period or something like that. Oh, and so uh, there, a crazy idea! You couldn't have a dedicated another GitHub repo that's a dedicated repo to storing the cache. Then you just read from there. You could, um, but because these uh, these files are. Um, Basically, we're talking about a, a, a gig uh, big that you could put it into the repo. Then you have to get into the GitHub large file system stuff, which is just a headache. Oh, no. uh, what about a volume, a mounted volume in the Docker container? Could it not update a volume? And then the volume uh, gets mounted 
during you, the vote. You could if you wanted to host like your own uh, NFS server. Uh, then we can't we use something cloudy like an NFS yeah. server to do that. You, yeah. you could do something like that, but because it's already built into GitHub, we're just going to use what GitHub has. But um, in Docker, uh, like if I look at the Docker um, desktop, I can share my my PVC uh, my my volumes with like I could share them with all everyone here, and they could just copy them and paste them, and they could use them. Yeah, Isn't that... that's basically Couldn't what's you gonna... that? You, you could um, again. But it's already being done. Yeah, it's already being done. So if uh, we look, okay. at... I I see the link in with is stored the cache in the Google Cloud. Yeah, you could use Google Cloud, um, but then it, then one of those things when you use those tools, you have to pay for the storage. <laughs> um, Couldn't when we, we use um, what about our bit our blockchain storage, the NFS storage? Uh, you could put it over there uh, and pull it from that uh, as part of that as a, as a possibility. But would I that think take too long? We we have to create a GitHub action. Yeah, then you end up creating the, the GitHub action and stuff. Let's look at, I know what other people do. So you use, most people use the built-in caching. Let's go to the project settings here. Uh, then we have to run it every 90 days or three months. Uh, Actions, runners. I can't remember where they hide it. Mm. Maybe at the org level. What about a cheap and nasty database server somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Uh, developer settings. I know it's out here somewhere. There's got to uh, be something for this. Like caches. you get all those cloud cloud storage things. Like what's it, MinIO and uh, stuff like that. So right in here, a bucket of some sort. So here um, we are already using caching. Um, so we actually have two active caches. Um, let's um, see if it's going to show us. Uh, oh, so these are the caches for. Um, the build X uh, program. So instead of us going down uh, and, and recreating the build X um, driver every single time, um, we actually go through and pull it from the cache. Oh, well, that's cool. So for us to enable this, it's actually pretty simple. So this is the action, uh, the cache a action. And if we go down to how to implement it, we are caching strategies, caching key. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to use this first one. Um, basically, we're going to say the path to our dependency, um, which will be our, our job, our MITRE job lib file. And we're going to create some, some key um to do our caching you know what what are we gonna uh, if that key changes then we need to recreate the cache so one of that's the things we'll do right? that's the key right the hash key no it's right? just a, it's just it. a it's a hash key to determine <laughs> if something's changed oh it's a unique identifier in a way and then if it yeah. changes it changes the hash key. okay cool yep so what we're gonna do is Hmm. We want to do this after. Let me see. If I get this right, I got to remember the order. So our path is going to be in our root directory with MITRE job lib is the name of the file. 
the runner. So if you're running this on Mac versus um, uh, it, it, you know AMD or Linux, um, we could you, you could use the key as the runner. Um, we're gonna t t do this. We'll actually keep the runner in there just to. So we'll do the runner, uh, and you'll see here. And if I go to the other repo, the the files that, like I said, we were going to look at the JSON files. So the enterprise um, JSON file, the ICS, and the mobile. If any of those change, then we want to recreate um, the cache. So we're going to say star.json. What about using something like a Cloudflare? free account to stick it in like a cloud worker uh you could well cloudflare yes you like could a cloudflare um, worker. Mm -hmm. or um something like that it's like a lambda type of function right yeah so we're gonna uh we could use like a cloudflare like i said um we would have to push a one gig file over to Cloudflare and bring it um, back instead of it uh, all being yeah. inside of the uh, GitHub world. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Damn. So what Where we're going to do. Else's computer. Huh? Somebody else's computer eh? trying to store yep. your cache on someone else's computer. And you don't want it to go out of the data center because then you're just in the same boat. So what we're going to do now is we're going to check if it's um, if it's been uh, if we get a cache hit. So if we don't get a cache hit, then we're going to go ahead and do our um, our command. So basically, we got the, our ID cache. It's not dark. Okay. We got to put an ID on here. So let me make sure I got the syntax right. Yep. So we have our ID, our width, our path, our keys. And what we're going to do is add on to this. Hey, you see, Steve, I was looking at this on my Docker desktop. It's got a volume backup and share, right? Isn't there oh. a way of creating like a that's an that would be like an OCI image or something, right? That it could just read or mount into the container somehow. I'm, I don't know what the correct wording is to use uh, uh, jargon. Yeah, and that's the thing is um, you would you would have to um, get the connection between Docker and the cache. To work correctly on the during the uh, during the Docker build, so like mounting volumes and doing stuff like that during a Docker run is easy, mm. but when you're doing a Docker build, it's a whole nother world. Yeah, yeah. So we're adding on here. If if we don't get a cache hit, we're gonna um, add run these extra steps. And we're going to recreate the file. So we have, we're going to go out and check the cache for that file. Um, and if we, and we're looking for a specific key, um, if that key is in, it, it is in found, then we're, we're, our cache hit's going to be false. So we're going to get this is going to be not equal to true. So what that's going to mean is we're going to go ahead and uh, install Python, uh, install our requirements, and generate the data. So now let's make sure what we need to do to persist that. And I don't think there is anything we need to do to persist it, but I got to double check. Save primes.
So here's the restore. Let's make sure we got this going right. Okay, so in this can example, we're going to look for it. Uh, if it's not out there, our cache it is false. We go ahead and do it. Restoring and saving. I think that should restore keys. I don't know if we have to automatically um, save it. So no, you must use a cache or restore action before you use files that use it, providing the key. Let's make sure. I just don't know if we have to do the save. I think it'll watch over what we got going on. So let's go ahead and, and save this and give it a go. Yeah, good. Zoom is in the way. Come on. So we're going to add cache. Uh, Steve, can I throw another crazy idea out there? Yep. Have you ever heard of Git Annex? I don't know if this would help us. Allowing, allows you to manage large files with Git without storing the file contents in Git. No, I've so not heard of like that a, one. It's like a sim link, but in, um, yeah, I'll send it to you. I'll put it in the channel. Cool. I don't know if this helps us though, but it might be a way of ref referencing something without having to actually store all the data. Where's the chat? Was I put it in Discord? That's fine. And everyone can see it. And you don't have to get stuck into get large files, right? And you don't have to get into that mess. Right. So while that uh, that's building in the background, the, the workflow action. So with us just adding in um, this, the five lines, we're going to be able to get the uh, ability to do the uh, caching automatically. So let's see, workflow toolkit just got pulled. Cool. We'll go ahead and merge this. So I'm in the MITRE um, mapping one. This is the one that has the Python. Is that MITRE one? That's that one that makes like a massive database, right? Yep, that that's the blob. one that makes. Is, 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 is it a, just a blob object? Uh, okay. basically what it is, is a, you, you can think of it as a, a binary representation of all your Python objects persisted onto disk. Okay. So if I opened it in VS code, I wouldn't see any, it would just be scrambled. More than or likely. Able to actually... Okay. I, I, I've never. Like machine uh, code. Is it machine I'm... code? I don't know if it persisted as like a JSON structure or if it's mm -hmm. um, how it persists it. Okay. Basically, you're persisting a a, a, a dictionary um, onto disk. And is it an idea to maybe put that portion of the pipeline as a separate job that pushes that data somewhere to be? That's what I'm thinking. I was just thinking out loud, yeah. Yeah, you, we could do that. Book, we could we could separate it out. You could push it off. I don't know. Like this workflow, 
if it changes, it needs to kick that off, right? Is that another workflow before this one finishes? Yeah. So you could tell this one to like wait on that one to finish before this one carries on. Can you do stuff like that with GitHub Actions? Uh, I don't know if you can come back. Uh, I don't know if you can wait on another workflow to finish. Uh, I know you like can kick off another attack. workflow. I, think I can tell can it to that. wait on, if, right? If no, if you pass the dependency, like this factor dependent on that other one. Yeah, yeah. Like a wait on task, wait on this task before you run kind of thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, or uh, timeout for the five minutes. Yeah. So here, here's our, our cache action that we added. And this is that hash, uh, the key of all those, uh, the three JSON files. Um, and what we'll see here is it went off and uh, fail on cache miss we don't have to want we don't want it to fail we just want to give get, have it give us that status save always um, we don't want to go out and resave the same file every single time um, and you can see it went to look for the, the Linux is the the runner so we're on the, the Linux runner and our, our key um, because we had a, a, a miss on the cache we're going to go ahead and install Python, install our dependencies, and start cranking through our actual build of our Mathlib file. So, like, it will take another one and a half hours? This will take about another hour um, for and it to... So after, that, after that, it will be cast in the Autelius uh, yep. test. Yep, so you can see it chugging away. And theoretically, what we should be able to see is if we go back to our org level, and where was it? Actions, caches. Oh, there, caches. And it lists all the caches you got. Yep. So in, in this how, how one, when, that is not working. Is this working, but it's just too slow, or what? Is that what you're saying? Well, we have to. We haven't added anything to the cache yet because we're doing it for the first time. Oh, so it's going to take really long. Yeah. Okay. It's like yeah. You got so to... we're we're right right now we're generating the file that we want to cache. Okay. Oh, and so you just like, added it now. The the con the logic to do this for that. Yeah. Um. Okay. 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 Cool. So but this is like Arvind. After this? Now, it should automatically save um, when everything finishes off. So there's mm -hmm. there's a post-run action cache here um, that should persist the, the, the MITRE job lib file into the cache automatically for us. Like I said, that's going to run while okay Actually, so i don't think git annex is going to work then because it requires you to have to store the data and like you can use some super cheap storage and then you can reference it like almost like a sim link right yeah so that's not going to help us so. but won't it be fast after the first run because then it's all cached it's only going to do changes right yep so for us um if we go back and look at what we did I, my, I got something running in the background on my machine. I think it's the recording is messing me up today. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it destroys your machine. Yeah. So just adding these few lines and then adding on uh, the if statement part here, um, we are going to be able to get uh, our desired effect of having the caching uh, in place. So it's, it's, you know, like, so the next time we come along, what will happen is this will go out and check to see if that, uh, that key exists and it's going to return a, uh, a cache hit equals true. Um, and that file should be in our, 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 basically our build directory. 
and we'll skip over all this and we'll be able to pull it in from uh, automatically from the cache. Isn't that just one of the, the things you just have to do the first time you run it is going to take long, but then once it's done, it's done, right? And you don't have to yep. worry again. Yep, exactly. And unless, unless one of these files changes, um, so if the contents of one of our JSON files changes, we're going to get a, a new hash number because they, you know the, ha yeah. the hash numbers are based on the content. So what what, yeah. what that means is if one of the f JSON files change, uh, we're going to get a new hash value. And when we go to look up in the in the cache to see if that hash value exists, it's going to come back and say no, I I don't exist. So, which is a good thing because the content has changed, which means we have to generate, we have to go through the steps and regenerate it based on the new data in the JSON files. That makes sense? Okay. Yeah, but does it have to rebuild that entire file every time there's a change? Or yes. Can it just do like, oh, it has to rebuild the whole file again. So it's another, yeah. it's another hour again. So you can't just do like a, a block level change and it just makes the change like you know like when you do a backup yeah it just backs up what's changed instead of backing up the entire thing again right so this can't do that no because this this uh this the python script is pretty dumb on that front where it doesn't <laughs> load in it doesn't load in the previous version and then applies changes to it it just starts from scratch oh man so no wonder you got pain Okay. So that's why. That's why. But but the these files don't change very often. They'll change maybe once or twice a year. So we can do one uh, thing instead of using the cloud VM, instead of using a, the GitHub Action VM, we can use our own cloud VM. So the process may like be a the runner. faster. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good yeah, idea. We, we could we could install our own runner, um, but it's not going to change anything. Um, uh, you could you could have your own like custom runner, but it's still going to run on GitHub. And like you said, um, we could offload uh, this part of the process to another workflow, um, and then somehow copy it in, maybe using like a. Uh, a curl command or something like that. We could do something along those lines. Um, but again, the network traffic to bring it in from an external uh, endpoint is going to be more, uh, it's going to take longer than just using the get the built in uh, GitHub yeah. caching. Yeah, now I understand your, um, your dilemma. Yeah. I didn't really get it in the beginning, but now I understand better. Well, I, exa I exactly understand. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can't so it we creates this big blob like, and then it's returning. And, ooh, that's a tough uh, one. We can create the model in the runner and we can upload it in the artifact or cache in the GitHub. Uh, upload it where, Arvin? In the cache of GitHub. Uh, you can't really load it from your. You can't do. Um, if we go back over to here, there's like no way to, to do an upload to a cache. Um, it, the, the caches can only be added to from uh, the uh, actions. That's a good idea, Ivan. I, I, I see what you're saying. You're saying um, update the cache, you know, like just update the cache instead of rebuilding the whole thing, just add the the data yeah, that's changed. I think that's yeah. also a startup idea in which we can share cast of the build. Yeah, we could, stuff. we could, I think we could make a separate workflow that will add to the cache and then um, the other workflow could, um, yeah. could the grab, grab the cache. But what happens if there's a sequence problem so if mm. the first workflow that builds it uh, hasn't completed yet because one of the JSON files has finished, hasn't, you know, has been updated and, you know, we have um, just a sequencing problem. So instead of trying to do two different um, workflows, 
um, we just in in line with the the uh, the check. So if we don't find it in the cache, we'll just go ahead and run it this one time. But if we do find it, we'll just go ahead and use it. Yeah, but it seems like a very long process. It's going to be a long process, uh, no matter what. Because Couldn't we, we have um, something like four or five different models for that? Then but couldn't you, use, couldn't you use a couldn't you use a cache check before the process runs if it's still the same like I don't know somehow that one job runs updates the hash key somewhere when the pipeline sees that then it runs then it knows I don't know something like that yeah like yeah, I said you, just you, 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 it, it, you could um, you could do that um, but like I said you're gonna get into um, a more complicated uh, scenario where uh, you have one workflow dependent upon another, another workflow and then you're getting into all the triggering to make sure the triggering is the correct sequence. Um, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. So instead we just add our, our, our five lines or six lines of caching action and then our if statement here and we're good to go. It, it, yeah, it's, it's a lot of effort just to solve uh, a blob problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, then <laughs> see you there already. will be more <laughs> microservice in which we require something like creating the model that we are doing in the Michael one. Uh, right now, no. Um, but it doesn't mean down the road we would have uh, that same problem. Um, We'll, we'll have to see what the other microservices look like for AI and ML. Um, right now, there's no other ones on on the to-do list. Um, but if we do have one, we'll have to see how the data uh, is managed. Because like a lot of the lot of the things, if we go back to a previous run here. Uh, that one's running. Oh, it's a tough one, eh? Uh, one failed, one action, the update one. Yeah, so if you look at this one, so at the Docker build, if we go down a little bit, so this is, we're looking at the Docker build step uh, specifically. Um, and this is where we're installing all the the python libraries for the machine learning and let's see if it's in here it may not be in there yeah i don't see it um but there is uh, initialization and download of the uh, natural language um, pieces. So there is some initialization of the machine learning uh, models, uh, the natural language. Um, so we use stuff from uh, Stanford uh, NLP. So the Stanford NLP is called Stanza. Uh, you'll see where Stanza is being brought in there's all the pip here we're collecting stuff here um, here's stanza the skit learning uh, stanza these are the machine learning um, libraries um, so these are uh, ml models for basically the english language um, that we're able to download and install uh, at build time because they're not that big they're they're like 500 meg um, so those are relatively easy and we're able to uh, do this docker build under a half hour basically um, at that level so that that's where it's not a problem but when we run through um, the other one we got running this one creates a huge data set and takes a long time uh, you know over an hour to run 
So it just depends, Arvin, on, on how big the data is and where we're going to need to pull that data in if we're going to have to do this for another microservice or not. Yeah, and if we have a lot of data that, uh, we can create our own rag model, RG. Yeah. That would be interesting that we have our own AI bot or own ChatGPT based on this data. Yeah, and that's what we're we're kind of doing right now. We're we're taking, we're basically pre-processing um, uh, data through the machine learning model and then persisting it uh, into that uh, MITRE job lib file. Got it. And it's just because there's so much. Uh, so what the goal of this this microservice does is you take the 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 MITRE attack technique. So we'll look at enterprise make matrix. So this is the um, a, a graphical representation of that JSON file that we're loading in. So we'll go do content injection, for example. I put a link there. Allow like updating a, an existing yeah, cache. Like a, this looks like a Jira board. Yeah, it does look like a Jira board. <laughs> yeah. So this is the <laughs> the the content injection. So this is where that ID is coming from that you see uh, chugging along. So that's the technique ID. Uh -huh, and then the this AI is the. Team. Okay, then cool. this is the, the description that we're loading in. And what the problem is, is when uh, somebody does a CVE. So we'll go out to OSV Dev and we'll look at a CVE. So we'll just look at uh, da, da, da. look at Maven, for example. So here's a, a an injection uh, that's happening here. So if we actually go look at the CVE, so this CVE has to do with uh, injection. But the problem is, if you look at the CVE data, um, there is no link to the uh, attack technique that's going to be used. So all we have are basically these details. So we have this, this description that somebody that found this vulnerability wrote up. And because we have just this this little snippet of of um, description, we have no idea how to map it over to the you know seven hundred different techniques that are out there. And the reason why we want to map it is if we map it to um, from a CVE to a technique, we can then see if any mitigations need to be applied. So the mitigation could be like res restrict web-based content. Um, if we look at this minute mitig mitigation or uh, trusted VPN, for example, we can then say, OK, network guys, do you have trusted VPNs listed on your firewall? Um, and then that's going to be the mitigation to prevent this CVE from getting through. So what it allows us to do is to take a component that has this CVE, map the CVE over to the technique, and we can then, based on the technique, we can say, um, has this mitigation been put in place? So Arvin, this is kind of like on your to-do list for your, um, your issue for your um, like your open telemetry issue adding into an environment. Um, so at the environment level, we want to track what open telemetry monitoring they have in place because that's also uh, important as well. 
uh, on the monitoring aspect, but also we want to make sure that they have what mitigations have been put in place for an environment. With that information, we can then rank um, which components are most vulnerable uh, for a, a company. Because we can say, oh, you, the network guys have already put in VPN, trusted VPN um, filters, you know, like a whitelist. And because they have a trusted VPN uh, whitelist in place, um, we're mitigating this, this CVE. And therefore, these components that need to be fixed at the coding level can be bumped lower in the list. You know, they're not a, not a high priority because we're already taking care of uh, making sure that that vulnerability is not exploited. So it's, it's a way for us to help rank what coding changes need to be done by the developers based on um, the CVEs and the, the, the MITRE attack techniques. That's how this all links together <laughs> and the mitigations in place. Other things. Yeah. Uh, I posted things, yeah. that GitHub is in the chat and you listed out the mitigation ID, but we have a lot of mitigation ID. You have given me some example. Yeah. So like we have to store it in another JSON file. Yeah, it'll be the ID. Um, it'll be the list of IDs. Basically, it's going to be a uh, for an environment. It'll be an array of strings, basically, um, for the mitigations. I have to do it manually, or we can like got the list somewhere. Um, you just in in your in your issue when you make your change is this defining the data structure to account for an array of mitigations and an array of detections. You don't have yeah. to worry about what the IDs are. Um, we just want to be able uh -huh. to add <laughs> to that array um, what mitigations that somebody applied through the UI. So like I don't have to upload the data, I just have to upload the data structure. Yeah, you just, you just the need data. to define the data structures. Got it. Because I was not working because I looked at this issue and I thought that it has a lot of data. Also like no, on it, the oh. it's, it's just defining the um, the data structures. So date defining the data structures for open telemetry. Uh, mitigations and probably want to. We should probably want to add detection as well. Yeah, I will schedule a call with you to go over that. Okay. Because and we are, I, yeah. And some of the things. So, some of the things because we're some of the like uh, attack techniques are only uh, applied to let's say a uh, Android. Um, let's say that the CVE that's showing up is um, is in some NPM code, for example, but we're running that NPM code on a Kubernetes cluster in AWS, and the um, the CVE uh, attack technique is only for um, a, a, a Android phone. So because the, the CVE is only for Android phone, um, that attack technique, and we're running on, our, we're running that CVE under um, Kubernetes in AWS, they have no way of, of attacking because our, our endpoint, it, you know, we're not compatible on the compatible OS, for example. So that's another aspect of it um, at that level is where your endpoint what your endpoint looks like. That you makes sense. It. Yeah, then the, yeah, the current structure will work. We can update the structure later. Yep. So we've gone through and um, finished our uh, process, creating that data set. And now we're onto the Docker builds. And they just started. They they take a little bit. They're going to take a half hour um, to to finish off. And but we did. Have a... Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. That's go awesome. ahead. I, I want to quickly. I posted a link. Somebody with the same problem. 
Steve, with your caching issue, and there's a work. He has a workaround in there. I don't know if that's going to help you. Maybe. On which which uh, Discord or chat? I'll put it in the chat and the Discord. It's the GitHub issue. It says Actions Toolkit issue five hundred five. All right, let me get over to. Sorry, Alvin, you go now. Yeah, and we have any updates in the front end side? Any update with what? On the front end side, the UI does is felt good one that you are working on. Um, I gotta get back to it. I've had uh, with me being gone with uh, CDCon and stuff like that. I gotta get back to the uh, UI side. Yeah, I will be also working on it. So let's save me any work related to that. Yeah. Oh, so th this issue that you posted, Sasha, we're not going to run mm -hmm. into that um, because uh, our, our okay. key is based on the hash of the content. Okay. Uh, so okay. even, even yeah. though we have the, if we look at the code here, so even though we have the same file name that we want to cache, we're going to store it under yeah. a different key. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's not going to help. So we're not going to run into that problem because of the way we're um, we're caching the file. And eventually, um, the old key, the, the, the old file that's been cached, will roll off um, out of the GitHub because it won't be accessed in so many days. OK, yeah. So it'll uh, GitHub will do uh, a cleanup of the cache for us automatically. Yeah, I see. Yo, tough one, eh, Steve? Cheapers. So yeah, that's why I wanted to bring it up because it's it's a uh, if you're not used to dealing with the GitHub actions and and making them run fast, it's a whole new world. <laughs> Well, especially when you're trying to do it free. <laughs> yeah. If you've got yeah. Doodles, if you're IBM with lots of dollars, it doesn't matter. Then it's kind of free because they got so much money. Yeah. But when you limited funds, then it's a different story. <laughs> you got exactly. it, reminds, it reminds me that IBM has bought the Hasikov coin. I yeah. think $6.4 billion. Yeah. <laughs> you see that. You see that. Like, not in Africa. In Africa, you got to get creative. Eh? We don't have big budgets <laughs> like that. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I can't speak for India and Mexico. <laughs> so um, I'll mm -hmm. keep an eye on this, and um, we'll make sure that everything gets cached uh, correctly. The only thing I can think of that we I may need to add is the save. Um, Based on the documentation, this looks like this is going to retrieve and save automatically for us. But if it does it, I'm, I'm going to add a save step down here um, to save mm -hmm. it. But I don't think we do. I think it's going to be automatic for us. Yeah. But I will keep an eye on it. It's an interesting use case, eh, Steve, because there's there are ways of solving it, but they actually create more headache than they do it's not worth it right to try and solve that problem yeah to speed it up right it's not worth yeah. it actually because it's going to involve so much coding and complication that it's actually not worth it eh? yeah and if we actually go in we could actually look at um uh we could actually mm -hmm. see how they're doing it so this is a nice thing. I'll go in and um, if I if some of the documentation isn't quite good. So this is a, a, a TypeScript program. Um, and there's a save, there's a restore. Let's see if it's in utils, action. So it looks like it is probably going to call a uh, let's go back up. Let's see how they do this save. TypeScript can be weird. Uh, 
Thanks, Save Elizabeth, for posting the free training. Here, set cache, save cache. What does save cache do? Save run. I thought it would be doing something with the GitHub APIs. What's what is it bringing in? Import cache from actions cache. There's the action. So I thought we'd run into some. I'd actually have to go and debug some of these packages to see how it's actually doing it. Here's uh, can you check the action utils file, the first one in the util folder? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yes. It, it, it connects up to GitHub at some point. Uh, it just says if it is GitHub. Is valid event. That is it as, um, yeah, that just, feature available. It's contained the test only. Yeah, I don't know how it's uh, it's doing. Uh, I will, it. I will read that file. Yeah, it could be in another um, another location, like the save here. Uh, so this. But that's one of the things I I'll sometimes go because here's the action. So if you ever need to know, um, and it's not quite documented correctly, just look for the action.yaml, and it'll give you all the variables uh, and whether they're required or not and, and stuff like that, So, and the outputs. So this is one of the nice things. If, if you're looking at an action and you need to know what it's actually doing, you know what, what parameters it will do, um, just go into that uh, action. So you can see this is running off of node 20, um, and it's off of the index dot JS in the restore and save. So just some stuff, some under the cover stuff for you guys to know about. And again, this is chugging away, but like I said, this, this one will be the long run. Um, so this will be the hour and a half uh, run, and then next time we run it, it'll just it'll skip over um, our execute Python script, which took 22 minutes. So our next run should be 25 about 25 minutes shorter than our current one, which is a big big savings. Steve, if we had a bigger um, virtual machine to bigger to like a bigger more resources would obviously go faster right i think so let's look at the resources like if you had more cores or faster disk for example right yeah let's see so this is running on ubuntu i know i know, I know we're trying to get away with and also open source you know you got limited budget so you're trying to get away with with that um but i'm just asking out of a to, I uh, think uh, if we, if I we think if that, you would it actually help? Yeah, I think if you're on a the, the GitHub Enterprise account, I think you can um, request. You can configure like the number of cores and stuff for um, a specific um, runner. Yeah. But because we're just doing it on the cheap, we're going to just use the default runners. Yeah, what are those? I think I've seen that before somewhere. Yeah, you go to uh, you go up to the org level and then uh, go to okay, settings. So OK. Uh, Steve, I found a file. Like in the cache, you have to go to the save impel file. I, I OK. Share it in the cool. So wow. if you look at 
uh, if you go into the org level, and this is kind of interesting, go to actions and then look at the runners. So you can actually look at all the jobs that are running at the same time and the, and the repository. So you can see that we have another um, uh, image being built and running in the background. Uh, so it can run in parallel. Yeah, so these are, we get uh, 20 different runners. Oh, wow. um, and, th and then they start queuing up. Steve, is it not an idea to have multiple runners with, you can't split up that that particular job. Uh, what's that one? That what's it called again? That thing that it's the, all the mitre stuff, right? Couldn't yeah. you know, like when you do a zip file, you you break it up into little pieces and then it converges it together, right? Yeah. At the end, could you do yeah, something so we, like that to make it we work? we kind of do. Um, so we'll run uh, the container release, and then once that was, that one's finished, we'll run the helm the SBOM and the trivia all in parallel. So we have the first one that needs to get done first because we need to know the the artifact. Once that mm. artifact's been created, then we do the helm, the SBOM, and the trivia all in parallel. Now what ends up happening mm. is um, the that will start eating up all your runners. So it's mm. you know you have a finite set of resources that you can um, uh, you're limited with. So would we could. Be cool we, if you could, if they had HA, like when you needed to do a fat job like this, is more runners come together to build that section and then they just bang down again, right? They ramp down. So it ramps up and then ramps down, right? Yeah. You still I got think, how many there? Uh, we have got 20. like 16, three. Yeah. yeah. So you'll, you'll see like when I run, when I go through and I'll make an update to every single repo. Um, it'll chug along all, you know, all day long, um, the number of runners. Cause I'll, I'll have about 50, 60 jobs queued up, um, because of all the, the parallel processing in, in the, the workflows and all the other like code queue analysis, Megalinter, uh, those type of things are all happening at the same time that it just, it eventually, cause we're not in any big hurry, it'll eventually get through it. Okay, yeah. Sure, tough one that eh? So let's look at I'm coming back with the cat. The cat is very demanding because my wife is away, so now she's taking place. <laughs> bring, bring, him to the, uh, bring him to the call. Yeah, let me look at here's that save no. implementation. Yeah. Okay. I was seeing. I didn't see where. Game is quite cute. So here's the uh, here's the guy. Uh, that it's being called, but I don't know what library it's coming from. So cache, save a cache. Uh, you can see there, there's no function definition for it. So it must yeah. be coming in from a, a, a library. What is that package.json? Is this someone else's uh, code or what that's caching? Yeah, this is somebody else's code. Jeepers, man. So there's an actions cache. This guy is calling himself. Yeah, and which is weird. Yeah, I don't know where it's coming from. I'd have to. It could be just like a command line program that eventually gets executed under the covers or something. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on this? I hope this kind of gives you an idea of how to handle um, these large files and how we can make make the actions uh, a little bit faster. Yeah, it's a tough one. Eh?
Seems like you're limited by GitHub, eh? Seems that way. Which is fine. Um, I found that Accent Cache is an NPM package which is stored in the Accent Toolkit folder. And I shared the link of the, that package and cache folder. Okay. Let me look at that one real quick. So it's coming from the toolkit. GitHub right. Okay. Cache. Restore cache. So, oh, it creates a tar file. Interesting. Ah. Uh, here's save cache. So it, it compresses stuff, resolves the, the stuff, gives you a file name, creates it. Uh, it's, it's talking to some HTTP endpoint to reserve the path to make sure you kind of like put a lock on the path. And then it looks like here's a save. Yeah, it's uploading the file to an HTTP client. That is stored in the internal folder. Yeah, yeah. Let's see, create. Uh, create a SGP client is a node method. Yeah, I was just seeing if it had the, the URL. I'm guessing uh, it's going to be some sort of um, no, GitHub it's URL. Built, no, it's a built-in method of the Node.js. Okay. We use this to uh, port it in the yeah. local or something like that. And let me double check if they have the node installed. And they are using annex.json, so I think it's, an, it's a monorepo. Yep. And, it's, and it has a, you're getting your token, uh, signing in, those type of things. So it's, it's basically talking to a RESTful API endpoint on GitHub to take your file converted into a tar file or your set of files converted into a tar file compress it and then push it over to the github api endpoint yeah so that's how basically how it's working it's clean Good find, Arvin. All right, anything Nine else? Minutes. All right, my dogs are needy now, uh, so I got to go. One last thing is we can <laughs> yeah. actually alter this. If we copy the toolkit folder, we can fork it. We can manipulate it on our own needs. So yeah, that's, 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 that's a little too ambitious for me. <laughs> yeah, but there will be options for us in the future. If someone want to do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll let somebody else handle uh, maintaining that for us. Yeah. Not enough the uh, cycles in the day to do it. <laughs> yeah, this is exactly. Yeah. Alrighty. Hopefully this is helpful. Okay. Give me a in under the covers of what we got going no, on. I learned a lot now. Builds. Thanks. Yeah, same. And Elizabeth. Yeah. All right. Thanks we'll for see the. Everybody. Yeah, it's create more users. All right. Create more services. Okay then. All right. Bye. Bye.